up, but it seems like everybody else is caving in as well uh, in terms of Conyers and in terms of other people, and you're right. Uh, Obama made it very clear he tried to keep single pair of people completely out of that big summit that he had. It was such an obvious thing. And so we, uh, we really do have an uphill battle. But I can tell you on the ground, people see the health care reform thing for what it is, and we know that single pair is really the answer. And so how do we advance the movement and really build it, given that there are some strategic alliances that are possible, even um, with the folks uh, in that graveyard of social movements known as the Democratic Party. I, I think we can still probably find some, uh, some alliances there. And so if you can just say strategically how you think we can move over the next um, year or so. Okay, I, I'm going to get just, just from my own political experience. I mean, strategic alliances are essential. But the strategic alliances that I, I uh, talk about and have experience with and I think are critical and in fact decisive are the strategic alliance among the working class. Um, there are rank and file um, activists in labor unions who are frustrated with the uh, bureaucrats and the uh, leaders of these unions who speak for them and at them all the time. And I would encourage a strategic alliance among these um, progressive, Democrats within, real Democrats within these unions to begin to build alliances with um, community members who are not in unions, who are workers who are not organized, and to begin to speak to them um, and open spaces for them to speak with, with each other around their common interests interest around health care, job security, and rights. And through those alliances, cloud can be built within the union and po a power base to move the, the labor aristocracy in some degree. I mean, there are strategic alliances that need to be built among the, uh, the, the disabled community with respect to the single pair movement. There, among the PD PDA, to mention a uh, group of Democrats who talk about uh, the, the so-called inside-outside strategy, and it's a strategy of social democracy. It's a strategy that was used by uh, Jesse Jackson, used by many folks. But oftentimes what they don't mean by that is an outside strategy that is legitimately outside, that is fully independent. Uh, Margaret and I and some others met with Olivia Boykins, a Congress person, the other day, and she mentioned the outside-inside strategy is valuable. But her definition of that strategic alliance was to dictate to the outside from the inside what the outside should be doing. That's the opposite direction. And that's not a strategic alliance. Strategic alliances are made based on a parity of power and, uh, and a parity of independent action. And so you cannot have a strategic alliance unless that alliance moves the agenda that you are, ha that you are empowered to move. And when that no longer happens, that's no longer a strategic alliance, that's a dependent alliance or dependency. And I think that there is a, there's a tendency, it may be unintentional, to cave into that kind of dynamic that we call a strategic alliance. Quite frankly, the Democratic Party machinery can do some things for us. And we must celebrate and push those things when they occur. But we cannot depend on them to carry the water. We cannot depend on them to go the distance. Why can't they go the distance? That party is a party of bankers. That's a party of landlords. That's a party of insurance, insurance executives. That's not your party. That's not the party that can guarantee health care as a human right. That's by definition and, and construct and the physics of it. So when you think of strategic alliances, think of those alliances that empower your capacity to move your agenda, which means a, a means to measure whether or not you're moving in that direction. And that has been a deficiency in the single pair movement to feel like going to la la land with respect to walking the halls of Congress and feeling good that some, some Democratic Party person or some labor union has endorsed um, single pair. They endorse anything. I mean, one of the definitions of politics is the art of compromise. And our assets have been compromised out. And it's, and it's done strategically for them. And we have to get with that. It's called just growing up politically. I hope I'm
Um, I'd like to share a, a little bit about um, my experiences in the state of Maryland where I live and where I've been uh, trying to organize over the last five years. Um, first off, this is an issue that I see as a nonpartisan common sense solution. It's evidence that, you know, it's backed by evidence, it's fiscally responsible, it sees that it's, it's morally right. It's just, there's no group that we shouldn't be reaching out to and speaking to about this. And I don't have any fear of talking to any group about this um, because I feel that this is, this is the right solution. And most people will get that when they, once you, you know, have that conversation. It's important to know that 10% of our health is, is determined by access to health care. 90% of it is determined by social determinants, which means a safe environment, free of violence, adequate shelter, adequate education, adequate uh, job, job safety, adequate income from your job, living with respect and equality and dignity, having clean water, having clean air, and adequate healthy food. There's so many groups that we should be coming together with and fighting for our healthier society, and this is part of it. So what we've done in the state of Maryland is we have, uh, we call created something called the Coalition for Health Security. And we define health security as every person is able to get access to high quality care without any fear of financial repercussions. You know, that if you or your family member becomes sick, you should get the care that you need and you should not have to worry about whether you can pay for food or your rent or whether you're gonna go bankrupt. So we've created a form to sign on to that Coalition for Health Security and we just started going out to organizations and saying, we have this coalition, we'd like to come and speak to you about single payer. Do you have a meeting? Can we come and speak to you? And so that's one way that we've gotten organizations to come on board and sign on with us. We've done leadership trainings where we train people to speak about single payer, and then we send those speakers out to their communities to start their own chapters, to invite their friends and neighbors to meet somewhere, a public library, a local restaurant, and then to grow that way. They decide the actions that they want to do, and they try to bring in more people. We have groups that are out tabling in, in local areas, educating. The key is we've just got to get out there, we've got to talk to people, we've got to educate them, we've got to bring them together. And for those that don't get single payer right now, don't write them off. Because I've had many conversations with people, especially in August at the town hall. So I, I stayed outside in my white coat and just went around and talked to people. And what I found is that if I first listened to them, and they were expressing a lot of fear, and that's because that's what's happening. That's the tactic that our government uses is to instill fear so they can control you. So let them express their fear. Be open to that and listening to that. And then once they've gotten through that process, I found an opening where I could speak from my personal experience and say, this is why I support this approach, and this is what it means to me. And that um, I found that, that opened a lot of doors. So I said, get out there and just, just do the work. Just get out there and do it. Whatever works for you in your community, do that. Real quick, I just wanted to follow up about this question of political alliances. We are going through something different. I had mentioned that it's easy for a union to pass a resolution. The thing that has gotten the union into motion is economic crisis and a change situation in the automotive industry as a whole. We have a situation now where new members come in making $14 an hour without pension without health care benefits. Those of us who have worked 30 years and were promised a contract are experiencing the loss of what we have been promised. That's what's pushing the union into motion. As long as the relationship between employer and employee mediated by the union was cozy, there was no possibility of shaking the union out of this narrow-mindedness. It was not going to happen. We are in another period, in my opinion, of history where we're just beginning to learn how to fight different. The severity of this crisis is such that we have to develop a different vision of what needs to be done. And it's not going to be easy. The retirees for single payer, we're open to everyone, but that's not enough. We have to figure out how to get in the community. 